John Ronald Rule Tolkien, Oxford professor, master of the languages and literatures of the ancient North, poet, storyteller, creator of the Ents, the Orcs, the Hobbits, the High Elves, the Black Riders, of Rivendell, Lothlorien and the Misty Mountains, of Mirkwood and the Black Land of Mordor, of the Fellowship of the Ring and the Dark Lord, J. R. R. Tolkien, maker of Middle-earth. The legends of the Silmarillion, root and ground of the world he created, have been an inspiration to other artists. The Hobbit, written for his children and published more than half a century ago, is known now all over the world, and The Lord of the Rings has come to be widely regarded as a formative book of our time. Nearly 40 years after its first publication, a special edition, illustrated by the artist Alan Lee, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Tolkien's birth, sold out as soon as it reached the bookshops. I think that I would say that the appeal, the attraction, lies in my father's extraordinary power of compelling literary belief in an unreal world what he called a secondary world. That is a world that exists only in the mind. It cannot be seen, cannot be found. It exists only in the mind. And many people have discovered, perhaps many people for the first time in their lives, have discovered that this is a very delightful thing. And this world that they enter proves to be an extraordinarily interesting place. With a long imagined past. In this world, strange beings, beautiful, noble, terrifying, hideous, strange places, strange events are encountered. But in this world of his devising, when you enter it, they are true. Their existence cannot be doubted so long as you're in that world because they accord with the laws that govern it. I think the ultimate secret of Tolkien's continuing popular appeal is something that was a mystery even to him. And uh, I would say it was a, a quality of imagination. He was able to imagine and to make real things which nobody had ever thought about before. Uh, the kind of thing I mean is, uh, for instance, Ents. Nobody ever talked about Ents before. They're not part of the, the background literature. They're not part of the tradition. He just made them up. But once he made them up, everybody understood them. Everybody could recognize them. Another, even more of its example, is Hobbit. Hobbit even sounds like a proper English word, but it isn't. He made it up. And he made the whole conception up behind it. And yet, once he invented that, everybody, in a sense, has understood it. And many people have actually imitated it. So he was able to, to create these creatures, and also, I think, these characters. I think you only have to say, uh, Gollum, Gollum now, and everybody knows what you mean and what kind of character you're imitating. This is a quality which very few writers have. Uh, they can invent a notion which becomes known to the wider world, even among people who haven't read the book. J.R.R. R. Tolkien was born in South Africa of English parents in 1892. When he was four, his mother brought him and his younger brother Hilary to England to visit relatives. During the visit, the boy's father died in South Africa, and Mabel Tolkien decided to settle with her two sons in England. It was to the rural hamlet of Sarehole, on the southern edge of Birmingham, that Mabel Tolkien brought John Ronald and Hilary. This was the countryside where she herself had been brought up. And it was here that Tolkien first discovered his deep and abiding love of nature and his roots in the West Midlands. Tragically, when John Ronald was 12, Mabel Tolkien died. She had converted to the Catholic faith some years previously and inspired by her memory, J.R.R. Tolkien remained a devout Roman Catholic all his life, as his eldest son, Father John Tolkien, recalls. It's one of those things that if you have something like that, you can't sort of say particularly where it comes out, I think. 
it pervaded all his thinking and beliefs and everything else. So I think he was very much uh, always a Christian and um, didn't like the changes in the church and post-war. Of course, he very strongly couldn't see any point in abandoning Latin because he spoke Latin. And he had his little, tiny little missile which he'd always had. I don't know how long he'd... I've got it, actually, in Latin. He used to try and struggle with using the Latin missile with the English mass. Clearly, as soon as his mother became a Catholic and he became a Catholic, he just breathed that air and it all fitted in together. But I wouldn't mean for a moment that it was his intention to write a book that would teach Catholic ideals through a book. That, that not necessarily, that wouldn't necessarily have been crude allegory, but it wouldn't have been the kind of thing that he would have done. No, the, the, the values are there all the time because he was that kind of person. But I don't think the primary intention at any time was to, to um, exhibit noble ideals to the world and try to persuade the world to live by them. I think he just held these ideals. The world of Tolkien's books was already forming in his mind during his school days at King Edward's in Birmingham and later as an undergraduate at Oxford University. His third son and literary executor, Christopher Tolkien, who lives in France with his wife, Bailey, has edited and published many writings that were left in manuscript form at his father's death. He speaks of the nature of Tolkien's world, what he himself called a secondary world. In his, his secondary world, which he worked on all his life, he developed it to this extraordinary vastness, solidity, and coherence, which is, I suppose, unique. And this secondary world, which is usually referred to as mistakenly, but entirely understandably, as Middle Earth, this comprehensive secondary world, inevitably it's his world, he uh, it, it, he, its content will be his content. It will contain his griefs, his hopes, his experience, his concept of beauty and ugliness, his concept of good and evil. It will not be an ideal world. He wasn't interested in utopias. Far from it. But it will to inevitably, I think, be an archaic world in some aspects. Its archaism shows itself at once in the relatively small space that the man-made takes in it in relation to the world we inhabit now. And uh, for him, the man-made was the great problem. He once said to me, you know, it isn't the not-man, like the weather, nor man, even at a bad level, it's the man-made that is so ultimately daunting and insupportable. So his secondary world contains an extraordinarily small, relatively speaking to our world, amount of the man-made. And it's very well known, it's often said, he disliked the modern world. Of course, this is absolutely true. But what I would like to say is that it was absolutely inevitable that he should. It springs from exactly the same source as his desire for fantasy. In the modern world, the word modern is the word that has to be emphasized. He loved the world, and he was in no conceivable sense a misanthrope. The modern world meant for him essentially the machine. And once again, this was a word that he tended, to, he tried to enlarge, so that when he speaks of the machine, and he more than once expressly said that it was one of the underlying themes for him in The Lord of the Rings was the machine. But we should think of something rather more than what the word machine naturally suggests to us, um, trains, motor cars, aeroplanes. He used it very compendiously to mean almost, you might say, an alternative solution to the development of the innate and inherent powers and talents of human beings. The machine means for him, meant for him, the, the, the wrong solution, the attempt to 
actualize our desires, like our desire to fly. It meant coercion, domination, for him the great enemy, coercion of other minds and other wills. This is tyranny. But he also saw the characteristic activity of the modern world as the coercion, the tyrannous reformation of the earth, our place. That is really why he hated machines. Of course, it's perfectly true he hated the internal combustion engine for perfectly good practical reasons. I mean, noise, congestion, destruction of cities, and many people greatly agree with him now. And Tolkien's distaste extended to modern, labour-saving machinery. He used to sort of say, you only move the slavery out of sight, so it's much more effective, because nobody knows what's going on. Mm. So you put them in the factories where you can't see them. He actually mentioned this in a letter that I think is worth quoting, that he wrote to me when I was in South Africa. And he spoke of the tragedy and despair of all machinery laid bare. Unlike art, which is content to create a new secondary world in the mind, it attempts to actualize desire, and so to create power in this world. And that cannot really be done with any real satisfaction. Labour-saving machinery only creates endless and worse labour. In addition to this fundamental disability of a creature, is added the fall, which makes our devices not only fail of their desire, but turn to new and horrible evil. And so we come inevitably from Daedalus and Icarus to the giant bomber. And of course, in his secondary world, the machine is, as he would say, mythologized in the mythological mode because he is dealing entirely in the representation of his perception of the primary world in the secondary world form, the world, if you like, of Middle Earth. And I think it is undoubtedly true that in this very large sense of the word machine, the supreme machine, in the mythological terms, is the ring is the one ring. This, of course, may seem extraordinary because many people would feel like saying, oh, but surely the ring is the most magic thing of all. To which he would have said, magic is very close to the machine. Magic is coercion, is the coercion of the world, the attempt by apparatus to transform the world. And indeed, the elves, as he again said, in, in saying all this, I'm largely drawing on what he himself said, putting it in my way. Uh, the elves represent, uh, obviously they represent in a sense an aspect, they must do, of the, the humane, they represent an aspect of mankind, but raised in certain directions to a higher power, with powers that men don't actually possess. And that the, 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 I, the ultimate aim of the elves is, re is art and not power, whereas men have taken the solution of of power represented by the machine. The ring is the ultimate machine because it was made for coercion, made by Sauron to coerce. And that is why the only solution to the problem of the ring, as the wise at Rivendell saw, was its destruction. It, and if the ring were not destroyed, it wouldn't in the long run matter whether Sauron got it himself. As he said once, Gandalf, if he had the ring, would be far worse than Sauron, because he would be righteous and self-righteous and order, coerce the world to its own good. And that was one of my father's greatest fears, was the coercion for good ends. He wasn't an unreasonable man, he wasn't an eccentric, he wasn't absurd. And of course he recognized that one must live in the world to, to an extent as it is. So he had a telephone, he even had a, a, a tape recorder when they were quite, quite newfangled. But as a vision of how the world could be, the uh, machinery of telecommunications just as much as the 
the airliner. No, they were not what he wanted in the world. I remember sitting with him, and I must have been quite a small boy, on the White Horse Hill in Berkshire, looking down over the Vale of the White Horse, through which the Great Western Railway Line goes towards Bath and Bristol. And I, I think even then I appreciated his intense awareness of that hill, the archaic carving in the chalk of the White Horse, the bones of the hill. One could see Weathertop in that. But I also loved the soundless sight in the valley of the train with the line of smoke from it. But he didn't. He didn't. He saw it as the intrusion of coercion into the Vale, carrying people at high speed to destinations that they would have been very much better off going by other means. But what aspects of the primary world did Tolkien value enough to bring into his secondary one? I think that the answer to that lies in the intensity of his love for the primary, fundamental simplicities of uh, not necessarily only of the natural world, but of the materials of the natural world as used by men using tools and not machines. So, uh, in food, bread, cheese and wine. The materials of craftsmanship, stone, wood, and so on. But also there was his extraordinarily intense feeling and amazing ability to visualize landscapes. Although, in fact, he traveled, as people travel now, very, very little. It seems that a little went a very long way. And he had a great, a great range of taste. Many people would naturally, I think, rightly associate him with, uh, well, of course, with trees, which has perhaps been, in a certain sense, exaggerated, because they had some sort of thing about trees. But trees are part of, of a much larger thing. Or one associates him with the Shah, because he so often said that he was hobbit-like. But I remember a letter, one of the many letters he wrote to me in South Africa, where I had been complaining volubly, as usual, about the, um, the awfulness. Um, I didn't like it. In memory, I love it. I would love to go back. Just as he once said that he would love, no, he never did, to go back to the long streets of Artois that he hated so deeply in the war. He said, I would have to go back. But he said, all you, speaking of South Africa and the high veldt where I spent so much of the time, all you say about the dryness, dustiness and smell of the Satan-licked land reminds me of my mother. She hated it as a land and was alarmed to see symptoms of my father growing to like it. But oddly enough, all that you say, even to its detriment, only increases the longing I have always felt to see it again. Much though I love and admire little lanes and hedges and rustling trees and the soft rolling contours of a rich champagne, the thing that stirs me most and comes nearest to heart satisfaction is space. I would be willing to barter barrenness for it. Indeed, I think I like barrenness itself whenever I've seen it. My heart still lingers among the high stony wastes, among the moraines and the mountain wreckage, silent in spite of the sound of thin, chill water. Intellectually and aesthetically, of course, man cannot live on stone and sand, but I, at any rate, cannot live on bread alone. And if there was not bare rock and pathless sand and the unharvested sea, I should grow to hate all green things as a fungoid growth. His more uh, passionate and exaggerated style. But I, I quote that because I think this is true. Um, he could even, uh, Bailey and I have, uh, used to think, that his marvellous description of the land called Ithilien through which Frodo and Sam and Gollum passed on their way into Mordor, this beautiful land of quick waterfalls and herbs that smelt when you walked on them, extraordinarily like parts of Provence, which he'd never seen. 
His sense of land and landscape was more than merely visual. Together with the language spoken by the people of the land, it was for him an essential element in what he described as his primary passion. A passion of mine, ab initio, was for myth and for fairy story, and above all for heroic legend on the brink of fairy tale and history, of which there is far too little in the world accessible to me for my appetite. I'm not learned in the matters of myth and fairy story, however, for in such things I have always been seeking material, things of a certain tone and air, and not simple knowledge. Also, and here I hope I shall not sound absurd, I was from early days grieved by the poverty of my own beloved country. It had no stories of its own, bound up with its tongue and soil, not of the quality that I sought, and found as an ingredient in legends of other lands. There was Greek, and Celtic, and Romance, Germanic, Scandinavian, and Finnish, which greatly affected me but nothing English, save impoverished chapbook stuff. Of course, there was and is all the Arthurian world, but powerful as it is, it is imperfectly naturalized, associated with the soil of Britain, but not with English. It does not replace what I felt to be missing. In the same letter, he went on to say, once upon a time, my crest has long since fallen, I had a mind to make a body of more or less connected legend, which I could dedicate to England, to my country. For Tolkien, this was a way of replacing that which England had lost. How is England demythologized? I would say the, the short answers are 1066 and the Industrial Revolution. In 1066, the uh, uh, English literary class was uh, eliminated or dispossessed. We don't know what went down the plug with them, but uh, we do know that, uh, that native English literature was replaced very soon by a French-based literature. And uh, what we've got left from before 1066 are fragments. Um, we've got Beowulf with Grendel. We've got Beowulf with the dragon. We've got the strange Siegel Herwan creatures who come out of Exodus. We don't have any Old English reference to Wudu Wasan, wood woses. We only get people remembering them some hundreds of years later. But the memory of them some hundreds of years later indicates that perhaps there was a time when people really did know what they were, but we don't know about it anymore because all that's been eliminated. So a whole uh, uh, tradition, I think, of non human supernatural creatures has just been wiped away with only a few smears and scratches remaining. And uh, that is something which happened to England because of 1066, which didn't happen to other European countries. And then the Industrial Revolution came along, and of course it came earlier in England than in other countries. And when it came along, uh, it took people's interests away from the fairy tales and the folk tales, which they used to get from their nannies. Now in Germany, they were still telling them in the 19th century when the Grimm's made their collection. But when English collectors went round trying to make similar collections inspired by the Grimm's in the later 19th century, there wasn't very much left at all. So uh, by the accidents of defeat in battle or of economic progress, I think a whole native English world of stories was uh, destroyed. And ever since then, England has uh, not had, as it were, a native mythology. It's had to borrow things from other people, like trolls from the Scandinavians, for instance. As a Dane, as a Scandinavian, somebody brought up in this part of the world and with the, brought up with a lot of the Norse sagas and, and the Eddas and things like that, which quite naturally came into my school curriculum, uh, I, rec I recognized such a lot of little snippets and bits and pieces. I said, I wonder who this man can be. He must know an awful lot about, about a Norse mythology. He, and uh, I could also see that he was doing fascinating things with words and, 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 uh, and names. And I could recognize little snippets again, which was, I mean, quite plain uh, Norse. Or, or I don't know ancient Norse myself, but I know Danish, of course, and I also know both Swedish and Norwegian. So I have a fairly broad knowledge of, 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 of Nordic languages. And I could see that this was a most unusual business. And, and, and um, I remember I even thought that there were bits 
that in his created languages, which sounded very much like Finnish. And it was only much, much later that I realized that they did indeed. Love of language was a fundamental element in Tolkien's creativity. At the same time, his love of the natural world inspired him throughout his life. He loved trees and flowers with a deep, urgent love, but I don't think he could really be called a botanist. He didn't have that kind... He obviously had the analytical wits for it, but they were all entirely used on philology. I don't think he would have wished... He certainly wouldn't have despised, but he wouldn't have wished to spend his time analysing plants into different species. They would, they would get taken up into the secondary world very quickly and uh, become th the plants in the in in of uh, middle earth like nifrodil or simbermina the white flower that grew specifically on the mounds of the dead he would see them clearly he had obviously a very powerful visualizing mind but i think that the name simbermina or nifrodil were absolutely essential to their existence in his mind one thing I think I've learnt from Tolkien, which I, I think he'd be pleased about, is that uh, he's made me a better observer. I actually look at things which he looked at, because I've read him writing about them, and uh, started taking interest in them myself. So uh, Tolkien, I think, is the, the kind of person who turns people into, into bird watchers, or tree spotters, or uh, hedgerow grubbers. People look at the plants and try to work out what they are, what their, what their old name was, you know, what they ought to be called now. A thing I never knew before is uh, the tree which I call a rowan and which other people call a mountain ash. Rowan is Norse. Mountain ash is modern learned. What's the English word for it? I never knew. But actually, I read the Lord of the Rings carefully and I realized that the old English word is quick by arm, quick beam, and actually the modern English word is quicken or wicken. Now, I know lots of people who have names like Wickenden. I just didn't know what it meant before. An established Oxford don Tolkien's genius was further employed in the 1920s and 30s, creating stories for his four children, John, Michael, Christopher and Priscilla. He had married Edith Bratt in 1916 and was now settled with his family in North Oxford. J.R.R. Tolkien was also a talented artist, and every December he combined this with his gift for storytelling. In 1920, when John was three years old, Tolkien had written a note to his son in shaky handwriting signed Father Christmas. From then on, he produced letters every Christmas to his children's great delight. They used to come either by post with the postman, because he bribed the postman to put them through the door with the post, or they, if they were a bit late, they were on the mat in, the, in front of the stove in the dining room, and there would be snowy footmarks across the floor. Um, we never discovered for a long time, never suspected that they were him, until one night we used to hang our big stockings on the bottom of the bed, and one night Michael and I still had a room together, and uh, he was, the door opened, we hadn't gone to sleep, and he stubbed his door, foot on the door, and said, blast, in the only way that he could say it, and we knew who it was, but we hid under the blanket so as not to let him know that we knew, and we never let on to anybody that we knew till years afterwards. He was extremely um, clever in making the whole Father Christmas uh, business uh, totally credible to young children. This was the thing of the postman bringing the letters to the door with the North Pole stamps on them. And the, uh, the whole way in which one, we put letters on the fire and in the earlier part of the year, say in October, they wouldn't go for weeks, and then suddenly they would go. And we, we were, at that stage of our lives, deeply convinced in the reality of this. Deeply convinced. Of course, one was more interested in the presence, in a way. Whereas you can see from his letters that there was beginning to be a new secondary world. There was a sense in which, nonetheless, we were actually drawn in, I think, 
to the secondary world, it was actually existing. So it was intensely exciting, intensely exciting and frightening. Because when one heard, one couldn't go to sleep on Christmas Eve, but when one heard the tread of Father Christmas's feet coming up the stairs, then one pulled the clothes over one's head and because something very strange had entered the house. After my father-in-law died and we received this vast mass of papers that he had kept all those years, some of which hadn't been looked at by anyone other than him, possibly not by him, uh, the, the Father Christmas letters turned up. Nobody knew that they still existed. Nobody knew that he'd kept them, but he had. And they were there, absolutely intact, with the envelopes, the stamps, and everything. And it was decided that, uh, that we could try to, to that it could be tried to make them into a book. Um, they do produce a fairly coherent story, even though they consisted of these isolated letters written once a year. And they, of course, do relate to his primary imagination. As Christopher said, the, the creation of a new secondary world began, but it was one which was very uh, closely um, related to the, to the main one. What do you think the poor dear old bear has been and done this time? Nothing as bad as letting off all the lights. Only fell from top to bottom of the main stairs on Thursday. We were beginning to get the first lot of parcels down out of the storerooms into the hall. Polar Bear would insist on taking an enormous pile on his head as well as lots in his arms. Bang, rumble, clatter, crash, awful moanings and growlings. I ran out onto the landing and saw he'd fallen from top to bottom onto his nose, leaving a trail of balls, bundles, parcels and things all the way down, and he'd fallen on top of some and smashed them. I hope you got none of these by accident. I've drawn you a picture of it all. Polar Bear was rather grumpy at my drawing it. He says my Christmas pictures always make fun of him, and that one year he will send one drawn by himself of me being idiotic. But of course I never am, and he can't draw well enough. When he'd picked himself up, he ran out of doors and wouldn't help clear up, because I sat on the stairs and laughed as soon as I found out there was not much damage done. The character of the polar bear, of course, who emerges as uh, more and more of a personality as, as uh, time went on and, and um, escapades um, involving him. But I think that the thing that s stays with me is the, um, the, the, the goblin wars mm. in the caves, mm. because I think that's the point at which it touches most closely the, the real imaginative creation. It has everything. It has uh, the, uh, Father Christmas, who is a sort of Gandalf figure. It had, it has the goblins. It has a runic alphabet. It has caves, battles, um, elves. Though they're quite different, but it, everything is there. The Father Christmas letters were produced in book form after Tolkien's death, edited by Bailey Tolkien but the first of his creative works to be published took shape as a long story read to John, Michael and Christopher on winter evenings. Now a classic children's book, The Hobbit, began in an unusual way. The actual beginning, though it is not really the beginning, but the actual um, flashpoint was I remember very clearly, I can, even, I took, um, I can still see the corner in, the, in my house in 20 North Moor Road where it happened. I got a enormous pile of exam papers there and uh, it, Marking school examinations in the summertime is, a, is an enormous, um, very laborious and unfortunately also boring. And I remember picking up a paper and actually if I nearly gave an extra mark for it, an extra five marks actually, with one page on this particular paper was left blank, glorious, nothing to read. So I scribbled on it, I can't think why, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. I think the, the hobbits uh, function as replacements for us or as creatures with, it, with whom we can identify. And I think this is something that happens quite a lot in historical fiction. To give a, an example outside Tolkien, 
Uh, C.S. Forrester's Horatio Hornblower stories have been very successful over a long period. Uh, and there you have uh, uh, a character set in the, the brutal world of the Royal Navy in the 19th century with, uh, you know, the lash and the rum ration continually being described. You can't help thinking, you know, how would someone like me manage in a world like that? And the answer is perhaps not too well. Well, Hornblower is a 20th century person in a 19th century setting. And he actually expresses the attitudes that we would feel. And he shows somebody who is like a 20th century person coping, coping very well in these extremely difficult circumstances. Well, the hobbits are rather like that. I wouldn't say they're exactly 20th century people, but they're obviously English people. And they're English people who are coping in a world which, uh, in a sense, is far too big for them. And yet they grow into it. You get Bilbo Baggins at the start of The Hobbit being quite sneered at by the dwarves who think he's absolutely no good for anything and nothing but useless baggage. Uh, but as the story goes on, Bilbo, though he doesn't become a, a hero like the dwarves, nevertheless shows that he can survive in that world, that he can manage, and that he has qualities which are at least comparable with the heroic qualities of the characters uh, by whom he's surrounded. The Hobbit, published in 1937, was a success. And the publisher, Stanley Unwin, wrote to Tolkien, a large public will be clamouring next year to hear more from you about Hobbits. They were to hear a great deal more about Hobbits. Hobbits are just well, rustic English people, made small in size because it reflects the uh, general small reach of their imagination, but it's not the small reach of their courage or latent power. I think the Hobbits are not only specifically English, but Tolkien would have said straight away that they're specifically West Midlanders, that they remind him of the society of his youth, and they come actually from Warwickshire, Worcestershire, possibly Oxfordshire, Herefordshire, but he really means a, you know, a very close area. And in many ways they represent, as it were, you know, traditional English feelings. One of the things, for instance, which Sam Gamgee says at one point, which is quite anachronistic in The Lord of the Rings, he says to Gollum, who is complaining about the food as usual, he says, look, if we ever get home, Gollum, I'll cook you some nice fish and chips. Well, potatoes actually shouldn't exist in, in Middle Earth because they are, uh, you know, a, a, a late introduction to this world. Nevertheless, fish and chips is the traditional English diet, and that naturally then is what the hobbits offer. That's their, their main idea of a delicacy. They're also, I think, uh, in a sense, a voice from the past, not the remote past, the rather recent past. But uh, the hobbits have uh, the attitudes, perhaps, of, uh, of my grandfather's time. They are firmly attached to comfort, to uh, six square meals a day if they can get them. Um, they haven't heard about dieting or slimming or anything like that. You would never get a hobbit jogging, I think, under any circumstances. Uh, nevertheless, they have uh, virtues of their own. And they are, as uh, Tolkien says, uh, surprisingly able to endure rough handling. There is a kind of toughness in the fibre which they have. Yet Tolkien himself was equivocal about both them and the book. On the 14th of December 1937, two months after The Hobbit had been published, and I think about two days before he began The Lord of the Rings, he said to a friend of his, he wrote to a friend of his, I don't much approve of The Hobbit myself, preferring my own mythology, which is just touched on, with its consistent nomenclature, Elrond, Gondolin have escaped out of it, and organised history. I prefer that to this rabble of edaic named dwarves out of the Voluspar, newfangled hobbits and golems invented in an idle hour, and Anglo-Saxon runes. Tolkien's own mythology had begun many years earlier, in his first and perhaps most important creative work, which would not be published until after his death. The Silmarillion was my... was the primary, central work of my father's secondary world. One of the chief things that people know about it, I think, is that it was unfinished. But I think this is, in a way, misleading. Uh, the real point is, is that there were several Silmarillions. When he was a very young man, during the First World War, and in the years immediately following, he wrote a work called The Book of Lost Tales, which the little notebooks that he used still exist, little penny notebooks, 
And some parts of it, he recorded, were written in the trenches under shell fire. And this was the first Silmarillion. I mean, he didn't then call it that. It's quite unlike his later manner of writing, when he adopted a much more remote, exalted even, manner for his mythology. It's more immediate. It's even funny. Uh, it's very f written in an extraordinarily flowery, consciously archaic manner, which I think is very attractive. But there already, in uh, often in very early undeveloped forms, are the great stories, the great legends, which were an inspiration to him throughout his life. Above all, the, uh, the lay of Beren and Luthien and the tragedy of Turin Turamba, Another Silmarillion was already in existence by about 1930. And that is very different. It's, it's as I say, it's in, in a more remote style, and it's, uh, it's more chronicle-like. The important thing is that that was finished. The Book of Lost Tales, you could say, was finished. The 1930 Silmarillion was finished. It's complete. A completely enclosed myth not presupposing any later ages. And at that stage, the Hobbit had no connection with it. In fact, he said in a letter that he wrote in 1964, he said, by the time the Hobbit appeared in 1937, this, the Silmarillion was in coherent form. The Hobbit was not intended to have anything to do with it. I had the habit, while my children were still young, of inventing and telling orally, sometimes of writing down, children's stories, in inverted commas, for their private amusement. The Hobbit was intended to be one of them. It had no necessary connection with the mythology, by which he means the Silmarillion, but naturally became attracted towards this dominant construction in my mind causing the tale to become larger and more heroic as it proceeded, even so, it could really stand quite apart. And so you see, the, uh, the famous names of Middle-earth, such as the Misty Mountains, Mirkwood, the Great River of Wilderland, they began with the Hobbit and had no necessary association at all with the mythology as it existed at that time. The Lord of the Rings was, began as the sequel to The Hobbit. But this dominant construction in my mind, as he says, attracted everything into it. Attracted The Hobbit and still more, of course, attracted The Lord of the Rings. So The Lord of the Rings becomes <clears throat> in the most complex fashion, both the sequel to The Hobbit and heavily involved with the Silmarillion. The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien's heroic romance, as he called it, with its vast imagined world, was begun in 1937. But it took him 12 years to write. At the same time, he continued with his academic work as Professor of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford, which was so closely related to his creative writing. I think that they were intertwined with each other. What I call the content, as opposed to the practice of his academic work, is one of the primary ingredients in the secondary world. Of many kinds. Anglo-Saxon above all. And, of course, the philology. The philology of the primary world relates very, very closely to the languages of the secondary world. Sindarin and Quenya, the languages, the elvish languages of Middle-earth, uh, they're totally different in the sense in which he meant, used the word fantasy, they're, they are the languages of the fantasy. But they're very hard, they're hard-bitten, they have their own severe phonetics, their severe grammatical history. It shows, I think, it's important, it shows what the word fantasy means. There's nothing 
crazy or absurd in the idea. His fantasy philology is just as, just as strict as the philology of the Germanic languages that he practiced as a, that he expounded as a professor. So I think that his academic, the content of his academic uh, life, as I say, intertwined and was productive, very productive, in his sub-creative world. It seems to me that he, uh, he poured everything he knew about early literature into the fiction and that uh, one of the great strengths of the fiction has been this sense of an enormous weight of knowledge and accumulated experience and accumulated thought which has been put into it and which cannot be counterfeited, which cannot be faked. In terms of actual content, of course, an important element in The Lord of the Rings, which plays no other part, no part in The Hobbit, I think, or, no, or in The Silmarillion, but plays a very important part in The Lord of the Rings, is the Kingdom of Rohan, which is modelled on, in a sense, transformed. It's not supposed to be historical because it's in the secondary world, but the inspiration for Rohan derives very evidently from Anglo-Saxon England. And the philology does not derive from uh, any direct imitation of real languages in the world, not at all. But of course it does derive from his mastery of the history of actual languages. That is to say, his knowledge of the history of English, German, so forth, other than Germanic languages. Uh, he used this. He used this kind of knowledge, his knowledge of phonetics, of phonetic history, to devise his own languages. That is what gives them their extraordinary credibility because he composed them historically. He started from ancient forms, and just as with a real language, within the history of Middle-earth, he devised the changes of pronunciation that overtook them, just as they do in real languages. And therefore, if he wanted a new word within one of these languages, he didn't uh, simply select a few syllables that attracted him, he worked out what that word would actually be. And he works out, as it were, the sound changes that will, it fictionally, will have passed over them in the course of time, as they do in all languages. And this is what gives to these languages their extraordinary one of the most powerful things in his, in his works, even for those who have no understanding of the nature of the philology, this extraordinary sense that they, they cohere, they are real, they have the trademark of being a totally individual speech. Just as even if you don't know French, you can say, that's French or that's Swedish, because they have the characteristic note and quality, and his languages do that. And were the languages Tolkien created comprehensive? They're not entirely comprehensive because uh, they don't have a big enough vocabulary. On the other hand, uh, I think what you do when you're creating languages is to work out the grammar first, and then in Tolkien's case you work out the main verbal roots, and then you play around with the verbal roots. And at the end of it you have uh, the grammar and the beginnings of a dictionary. Uh, but you also have the uh, potential for creating the rest of the dictionary but you don't have to create the whole of the dictionary. You only use the words you happen to, to, to need at that particular moment. I first began seriously to invent languages about the um, time oh, I was 13 or 14. I've never stopped, really. Languages have a flavor to me, which I, I never understand people saying, saying, for instance, it was awfully dry and dull, because a new language to me is, is just like taking a new wine or a new sweet beet or something. As the creator or sub-creator of these languages, uh, he could take great delight in them because he could make the sounds that were developed by the phonetic changes attractive to his own ear. So that he could say that Quenya was the language that he really 
deeply desired, whereas none of the languages of the world really came quite there. He loved Anglo-Saxon, but he didn't like it as much. He loved Finnish, which was an important influence on Quenya. But Quenya was the language of his heart. It was the language that he wanted. All I'm doing now is to try and write in Elvish, which I'm saying my writing is very inferior to the Elv. Their standard greeting when meeting, a star shines upon our meeting. Made a mistake, didn't I? No, we didn't. And that stands for Ellen Sila Lumen Omenti Elvo. It's a piece of rather beautiful language, I think. Are el bereskil soniel, sidivren penamiriel o menel aglar elenaf. Nahired palandiriel o galavremmin enorath, fanuilos le linathon nevaya si nevayaron. During the long years in which he worked on the languages and the legends, the stories themselves seemed to evolve as if under other influence than that of their creator. In the case, for instance, particularly of the Silmarillion, what is so fascinating is because it lasted so long. And because he wrote so many versions, you can follow the changes in great detail when you've got the papers in the right order. And the movements in the legends, moving from one text to another very gradually, mean that after the passage of years in my father's life, you have a movement in the legends similar to the actual movements in the legends of uh, actual peoples. So you see, in one particular case I can think of, uh, a great king in the earlier stages of the mythology, Orodreth of Nagathrond. He slowly, as, as the years pass, becomes diminished and is ultimately rejected completely from the dynasty the, the kingly dynasty he, uh, he belonged to. And the reason for this was that another of my father's legends slowly made contact with the first one and the internal dynamics of the legends forced this king into a inferior and therefore uh, he becomes cowardly, weak and in a sense uh, disappears through the sheer internal energy or dynamics of the movements of the legends. Throughout his life, J.R.R. Tolkien enjoyed discussing literary subjects with his friends and colleagues. He belonged to many literary clubs, both official and unofficial, where lively debates took place. In Oxford for many years, he was a central figure in a group called the Inklings. They met every week in a pub called the Eagle and Child. It's only uh, strangers who call it the eagle and child. It's really the bird and baby. Uh, and in the bird and baby, uh, the inklings, who were a group of like-minded dons and uh, near-dons, um, used to meet uh, from 1939 right through the war. They came every Tuesday lunchtime. They sat in this room, and they were, in fact, uh, a club, a male club. Uh, and they met also in the evenings uh, in C.S. Lewis's rooms in Magdalen. Very few outside his generation came to them. Uh, I was lodging during some of this period just up the road. Never knew they were happening, these meetings of the Inklings. But it was a very important thing. And it's nice to be still in this pub and uh, where you can um, uh, imagine them sitting around, not in great comfort, and during the war, not with even very much beer, um, but uh, talking uh, literary talk and uh, working in complete isolation from the rest of the literary establishment. During the evening meetings in Lewis's rooms, the Inklings read parts of their books to each other. The Lord of the Rings was read chapter by chapter. That sound, the bent shape of the king's crown suddenly erect. Tall and proud he seemed again, 
And rising in his stirrups, he cried in a loud voice, more clear than any there had ever heard a mortal man achieve before. Arise, arise, riders of Theoden! Fell leads awake, fire and slaughter! Spear shall be shaken, shield be splintered, sword day, red day, ere the sun rises! Ride now, ride now, ride to Gondor! The Inklings had a small nucleus of regular members, with others attending on an occasional basis. But at the centre of the group was Tolkien's great friend, C.S. Lewis. The profound attachment and imaginative intimacy between him and Lewis was, I think, in some ways, the, the real core of it. Certainly, it, it was of profound importance to my father, that, that relationship. Indeed, to both of them. The fact that they drifted apart in their um, later on, I think myself, is, it was sad. But I think I would say that it was no more than a drifting apart. I don't think myself that it really requires to be studied in, in depth. I think what I should concentrate on was the extraordinary support of mind of taste that they offered each other. I think he felt that he owed a very great deal to Lewis in his encouragement of him as a writer. And I think he did say, and certainly conveyed this, that but for Lewis's encouragement, when things were difficult, he might never have got The Lord of the Rings complete. So I think he felt an enormous debt to him there, and they mutually gave each other a great, great encouragement over their writings. I think that it was the most tremendous grief and blow when when Lewis died, even though in the years preceding Lewis's death, following Lewis's marriage, and also after his move to Cambridge, they'd not met regularly and they'd seen very little of each other. And there was a lessening of the bond, a loosening of the bonds, and a loss of what my father would call the communion between them. But nonetheless, I think the memory was always there and the affection remained. Um, in a letter he wrote to me, which was in response to a letter I wrote to him of sympathy after Lewis's death. He said that he had the normal feelings of, um, of a man of his age who feels he's losing his leaves one by one, but that Lewis's death felt like an axe being taken to the roots, which I think is, expresses far more than anything else what he must have felt. With Lewis's encouragement, Tolkien persevered with the enormous task of completing The Lord of the Rings. It is often said that the writings of any major author must, to some extent, be autobiographical. How true was this in Tolkien's case, both specifically in The Lord of the Rings and generally in his other works? I have a passage taken from my father's story, Leaf by Niggle, which is probably the most obviously autobiographical of anything he wrote, I think. And Mr. Niggle is, is a painter who can never get his big work finished, which is the painting of a tree. And finally he comes to die, which is what is called in the story, going on a journey. And he finds himself eventually in another country. Niggle pushed open the gate jumped on the bicycle and went bowling downhill in the spring sunshine. Before long, he found that the path on which he had started had disappeared and the bicycle was rolling along over a marvellous turf. It was green and close and yet he could see every blade distinctly. He seemed to remember having seen or dreamed of that sweep of grass somewhere or other. The curves of the land were familiar somehow. Yes, the ground was becoming level as it should, and now, of course, it was beginning to rise again. A great green shadow came between him and the sun. Niggle looked up and fell off his bicycle. Before him stood the tree, his tree, finished. If you could say that of a tree that was alive, its leaves opening, its branches growing and bending in the wind that Niggle had so often felt or guessed. 
and had so often failed to catch. He gazed at the tree, and slowly he lifted his arms and opened them wide. It's a gift, he said. He was referring to his art, and also to the result. But he was using the word quite literally. And that passage, I think, illustrates very profoundly my father's belief in the source of his own inspiration. One of the things where I feel uh, rather sympathetic to Tolkien is that uh, he was a very private person. He uh, didn't expect, uh, as it were, to have biographical criticism perpetrated on him, and I don't think he'd have liked it if it had happened. Having said that, nobody can avoid putting their personal life into their fiction. I mean, what else have you got to put into it other than, in his case, uh, the, the learning? So I'm sure that in uh, many respects, uh, like, for instance, his war service, uh, his experience with the war and also the terrible experience of having been in the war to end all wars and then seeing his sons go off to fight the next war to end all wars. All that, I think, is uh, very much part of his fiction. And one way of looking at, uh, at uh, The Lord of the Rings, I think, is to see it as a, a post-war book, except, of course, it was written during the Second World War. But all that, I think, affects it powerfully. He was a very jovial man and loved good company, good wine, good conversation. But it frequently came through that he had an underlying melancholy. I think he believed very deeply in the mythical historical framework that the world is running down from a golden age and has gone fairly far. And that, of course, is, is also the framework of his whole creative work, now that we have so much more than just the Lord of the Rings. And his sorrow at the destruction of the English countryside, this came out again and again and again, and that is really encapsulated in what the heroes of the Lord of the Rings found when they went back to the Shire. And the sense of evil actually comes across to me more powerful, more powerfully in that scene when they come back to the Shire and see that the meanness of the destruction, this is more powerful to me than all the evocation of the, the grand and cosmic evils of, of Mordor itself. Because I think it, the other was storytelling, but this was what he had felt. It was one of the saddest hours in their lives. The great chimney rose up before them and as they drew near the old village across the water, through rows of new mean houses along each side of the road, they saw the new mill in all its frowning and dirty ugliness, a great brick building straddling the stream, which it fouled with a steaming and stinking outflow. All along the Bywater Road, every tree had been felled. As they crossed the bridge and looked up the hill, they gasped. Even Sam's vision in the mirror had not prepared him for what they saw. The old grange on the west side had been knocked down and its place taken by rows of tarred sheds. All the chestnuts were gone. The banks and hedgerows were broken. Great wagons were standing in disorder in a field beaten bare of grass. Bagshot Row was a yawning sand and gravel quarry. Bag end up beyond could not be seen for a clutter of large huts. They've cut it down, cried Sam. They've cut down the party tree. He pointed to where the tree had stood, under which Bilbo had made his farewell speech. It was lying lopped and dead in the field. As if this was the last straw, Sam burst into tears. Tolkien, I think, had a, uh, a, uh, a melancholic streak. Perhaps that's putting it uh, too far. I, I would put it this way, that uh, uh, when he was 22, he had uh, many friends. When he was 26, they were nearly all dead. Uh, obviously, an experience like this does uh, affect anybody. And uh, from a very early period, uh, Tolkien obviously uh, continues to think about death. And uh, part of his uh, mythology is to construct a race of creatures who are deathless. 
and who wish to escape from deathlessness in the way that human beings wish to escape from death. But the centre of all that is the thought of death. The strange thing, perhaps, is that everybody thinks like this sooner or later or at some time, but Tolkien was thinking about that very early on, and it was a thought which never left him. But I think the reason there is actually quite clearly biographical. It's caused by the experience of the First World War and by seeing his whole generation of age mates at school just wiped out apart from himself. If you really come down to any large story, it interests people for, uh, can hold their attention for a considerable time or, or make the, the stories practically always, a human stories practically always about one thing, aren't they? Death. Inevitably death. The passage in The Lord of the Rings which most clearly recalls the First World War is uh, when Frodo and Sam with Gollum are actually crossing what they call the Dead Marshes. Now the Dead Marshes look very like a First World War battlefield. Uh, they're flat, uh, they're covered in craters, there's ash heaps and slag heaps, and the really striking thing is that there are the unburied dead all over the place. You look down in the pools and you see the dead bodies looking back at you. Actually in the Dead Marshes this is a phantasm or an illusion because the dead bodies aren't really there. They've been buried you know, many ages ago. But uh, actually, the fact that it is an illusion uh, makes you think that this is a reflection of a reality which Tolkien had himself seen. There is no such thing as a natural death. Nothing that happens to man is ever natural, since his presence calls the whole world into question. All men must die, but for every man his death is an accident. And even if he knows it and consents to it, an unjustifiable violation. Well, you may agree with uh, words or not, but those are the, are the key spring of the Lords of the Rings. If death was the great underlying theme of the Lord of the Rings, what were the sources of Tolkien's special creativity? I always, in the writing, always start with a name. Give me a name and it produces a story, not the other way about, normally. I think a lot of his creativity came out of a kind of careful brooding about the history of places. Uh, the Lord of the Rings, in some ways, is a work governed by a map, and that map is a map of fantasy. But behind the map of fantasy, there is a real map of England. Uh, but you have to know that real map very well. You have to know it down on the level of names of streets, not just names of towns. For instance, if I could give one example, just outside here, 100 yards outside here, we have Woodhouse Lane, which goes over Woodhouse Moor to Woodhouse Ridge. What does Woodhouse mean? Well, if you look it up in the book, it says House in the Wood, which is pretty boring. But Tolkien knew that actually nobody around here says Woodhouse, they all say Woodhouse. And actually some of them say Woodhouse. Now a Woodhouse is a different thing from a Woodhouse and Tolkien thought it might have meant once upon a time, not house in the wood, but Wuduwasa, which means wild man of the woods, Woodwose, satyr. And that in a sense is the start for his picture in The Lord of the Rings of Garn Buri Garn, the headman of the, of the Woses in the woods. Well Tolkien obviously thought to himself, what is a wood woese? Did they really live here? It's a very good place for wood woeses because it is, as it were, a heavily forested and steep site where wild men could lurk for a long period. Well, he obviously thought about that. You wouldn't think about that if you didn't walk along the road. And then again, I think he set his story, Farmer Giles of Ham, in Brill, which is, oh, ten miles outside Oxford. And the reason uh, I think he was interested in that was that he knew that Brill had a Celtic element in it. It means Bree Hill. And when he looked at the map, he discovered there was a little cluster of these Celtic stroke Anglo-Saxon compounds. And of course, he uh, wanted to know why, and he ended up telling himself a story about it. So very often, I think, that uh, the story of the fiction comes out of a name and a wonder and a question which you ask yourself. And often, the, I must say, I found that the, the answers which he worked out to be uh, extremely surprising. I don't think anybody else would have worked them out. To give uh, one example of that, uh, one of the, I think the first word that we ever get in the Lord of the Rings, which is from the language of the riders of Rohan, which is a, a kind of old English, uh, is emnet. And when I first read this, I thought, emnet, never, never come across it. Don't know that word. Wonder what it means. Um, so I looked it up in the, uh, in the Oxford Book of Place Names. And of course, there is a place called emnet. Actually, it's emnet, and it's in Norfolk. And then I worked out what it meant in old English, and it means em and meth the even meadow. And I realized actually that what Tolkien had asked himself was if the old English had not lived in a wooded hilly island but lived on a flat grass plain 
What would they have called the flat grass plain? What would their word be for steppe or for prairie? What would the native English word for that be? And he answered that it actually would be an mnet. And we haven't got any mnets in England, except actually, of course, in Norfolk. That's the one place where you do find flat grass plains. So he told himself that this is the answer to it. And again, the, uh, the, the, the thought and the word and the place name give you uh, a major element in the, in, the, in the culture, in the whole build-up of uh, the riders of Rohan, of the Riddermark. So all, all the time, I think, uh, uh, his mind turned on uh, names and places and landscape and history. And it's from that that uh, the fiction develops. The love of, of word lore came first, and then the imagination of a world for the languages to live in, and then the story grew with this extraordinary experience to which he bore witness that the story told itself, that he, as it were, heard it and, and put it down. And two of the things that give it its incredible coherence and convincingness, inducing what Coleridge called the suspension of disbelief, it is that the language is so coherent, whereas in many other fantasies you feel that the names are like pantomime names, they're just reached out from here and there, but uh, his names are all coherent, and he explains they've all got meanings in the different languages. And the other thing is that he had this strong experience that it was given to him, that he was recording something that was happening, and therefore the story was all important. Priscilla Tolkien recalls that parts of the story of the Lord of the Rings had a powerful effect on her, particularly the description of the Black Riders. I remember that I had nightmares about the Black Riders. It was so powerful. But the other thing I remember too is that when I came to read the book and reread it a long time afterwards, um, I still felt just as frightened, even though I knew what was going to happen, that they would eventually get away, as it were, from the Black Riders. And that, I think, remained in my mind as a very important fact about literature, that the, that the important thing is the, is the threat and is the feeling that you have, the fear, and not actually knowing what happens. That's perhaps one reason why I always have found Who Done It's rather unsatisfactory form of reading, because if it's just the thrill of finding out what happened, you don't really want to read it again. But if it's the emotion, then that's forever if it's, if it's great literature. And it's a very good book. It's well written, um, it's extraordinarily rich and complex. It has some very sharply drawn characters, and it is an absorbing story. It's one of the oldest stories, The Journey, and, uh, and one of the newest in its new old treatment. Uh, but the book itself is good. It's not just a freak. He was a very good writer, and he knew what he was doing. I suppose that my favorite character out of all of those wonderful characters would be Frodo, who to me, and there's a great debate about this, is really the hero of the story. They're all marvelous, and I love Pippin and Mary, who gets kind of overlooked. But Frodo seems to me uh, at once the most deeply timeless and the most modern uh, of all the people in the story. And to me, it is both uh, a very mythic uh, and a very medievally colored story, but I think it is very deeply rooted in the 20th century, in Tolkien's own time and place um, and, uh, and sensibility. And I think Frodo reflects that more than any of the others. He is um, somebody who takes on a job because he has to, that nobody else wants, and that is doomed to failure. Uh, he's too little for it, literally and metaphorically, and yet he rises to it better than anyone else could. And he fails heroically. And that, to me, is very much a manifestation of our own time and place and what uh, everybody feels about this century that we're in. Frodo is the most ordinary, 
uh, and the most extraordinary of the hobbits, very quiet. He doesn't have the personality quirks that some of the others do that makes them more fun to play. He doesn't have the speech patterns that Gollum has or the kind of childishness that makes Gollum terribly attractive. But Frodo um, could be any of us, and I don't think any of us would want to be Gollum, although we can recognize it. Frodo tries very hard um, to do something impossible. He gives up everything in the course of it. He loses everything. Tolkien's very tough on Frodo, uh, and I, I find that very moving. This is the end of the Lord of the Rings, the end of the last chapter. And I begin with uh, Gandalf speaking at the Grey Havens as he and Frodo prepare to leave in the last ship. Well, here at last, dear friends, on the shores of the sea comes the end of our fellowship in Middle Earth. Go in peace. I will not say, do not weep, for not all tears are in evil. Then Frodo kissed Mary and Pippin, and last of all Sam, and went aboard. And the sails were drawn up, and the wind blew, and slowly the ship slipped away down the long grey firth, and the light of the glass of Galadriel that Frodo bore glimmered and was lost. And the ship went out into the high sea, and passed on into the west, until at last, on a night of rain, Frodo smelled a sweet fragrance on the air, and heard the sound of singing that came over the water. And then it seemed to him that, as in his dream in the house of Bombadil, the grey rain curtain turned all to silver glass and was rolled back, and he beheld white shores, and beyond them a far green country under a swift sunrise. But to Sam, the evening deepened to darkness as he stood at the haven. As he looked at the grey sea, he saw only a shadow on the waters that was soon lost in the west. There he stood, far into the night, hearing only the sigh and murmur of the waves on the shores of Middle Earth, and the sound of them sank deep into his heart. Beside him stood Mary and Pippin, and they were silent. At last the three companions turned away, and never again looking back, they rode slowly homewards, and they spoke no word to one another until they came back to the Shire, but each had great comfort in his friends on the long grey road. At last they rode over the downs and took the east road, and then Mary and Pippin rode on to Buckland, and already they were singing again as they went. But Sam turned to Bywater, and so came back up the hill, as day was ending once more. And he went on, and there was yellow light and fire within, and the evening meal was ready, and he was expected. And Rose drew him in, and set him in his chair, and put little Eleanor upon his lap. He drew a deep breath. Well, I'm back, he said. Twelve years after he had begun it, Tolkien finally completed The Lord of the Rings in 1949. But he had great difficulty in finishing it. He would rewrite passages time and again, constantly seeking a better expression, and he put the greatest emphasis on the accuracy of the smallest details. I do remember him saying things like um, that he had to rewrite a whole part of The Lord of the Rings because he, or at least a whole chapter, which was, might have been quite a lot, because he had um, described something as being by full moon and realized on looking back at the time scheme that, the, that he was a day in advance, that the moon couldn't have been full till the next day. And I mean, one person in a thousand of readers would probably have noticed that, but it was, he wouldn't dream of leaving something like that in. The moons, I think finally, uh, the moons and the suns have worked out according to what they were in this part of the world in 1942, actually. 
I mean, one, I couldn't, I'm not a good enough mathematician or astronomer to work out where they might have been 7,000, 8,000 years ago, but as long as they correspond to some real configuration, of one was good enough. Despite Tolkien's perfectionism, The Lord of the Rings was at last published in three volumes during 1954 and 1955. It was a book in an entirely new genre, and the publishers all worried about its reception. These worries were shared by the book's author, as he confided to his close friend, Father Robert Murray. He just had no idea how, how they would take it. And Rainer Unwin himself had um, slightly suggested such fears to him that people would think of it as an allegory or a book with a message or something, and he abhorred that idea. So he really didn't know what would happen. He thought it might be taken in a, in a, a vulgar spirit, just as a thriller. He thought it was the most important thing he had done. He cared deeply about all the values which are enshrined in it, which are very old-fashioned values, the values of ep epic poetry and chivalry and all kinds of things which people now connect with the Middle Ages. He cared very much about all these things. And I think that those ancient values are very far from dead, but have been stifled in modern culture, but he tapped the sources of continuing enthusiasm for them. The whole position of Aragorn as the king who is to return is like a kind of secular messianism, an expected king, a descendant of the glorious king of the past, who is going to come back. We're familiar with its Jewish biblical form, but uh, there's an analogous form in the idea that King Arthur is not dead but sleeping and will come back, which is there in some strands of mythical thinking in our literature. And I, I think he, he tapped all that. And in a letter to Father Murray, Tolkien said, I'm afraid it is only too likely to be true what you say about the critics and the public. I am dreading the publication for it will be impossible not to mind what is said. I have exposed my heart to be shot at. I think the publishers are very anxious too, and they are very keen that as many people as possible should read advanced copies and form a sort of opinion before the hack critics get busy. When it first came out, the, uh, most of the first reviews of it couldn't have got it more wrong. I think uh, my favourite comment is by the reviewer in the Times Literary Supplement, uh, 25th November 1955, who uh, nailed his colours to the mast. He said, um, this is not a work that many adults will read right through more than once. Well, that must have seemed a safe bet at the time, because uh, it's 1,200 pages long, and you wouldn't expect many people to read it right through more than once. But actually, of course, they have. It is a book which has been read through by an enormous number of adults many more times than once. Another classic, I think, really, Again, uh, you know, a book when people might possibly have, have learnt better. This book says, talking in a very advanced critical language, that uh, The Lord of the Rings is overcoded because the megatext has to be constantly explained. Well, leave that aside. But it goes on to say, nor are the histories and genealogies in the least necessary to the narrative, but they have given much infantile happiness to the Tolkien clubs and societies. Well, that's just... That's just name-calling, infantile happiness. But when uh, somebody says the histories and genealogies are not in the least necessary as the narrative, now that's dead wrong. That's not only wrong, that's stupidly wrong. Actually, what they give to the narrative is something which Tolkien was very aware of and which he often talked and wrote about and which he valued very much, and that is depth. So you don't just have, as it were, a flat, garish, shiny surface. You have something which has depth behind it and a feeling that this is a world where... You can ask a question about it and you'll get an answer. And if you ask a question about the question or a question about the answer, then you'll get more answers because it's all there already. And that gives you an illusion of reality. But the illusion has been deliberately created. The critics were varied in their reaction to The Lord of the Rings. Among the condemnations, there were some significant good reviews. Bernard Levin wrote that it would be impossible to do justice to this magnificent book. To begin with, the learning is prodigious. But why did some of the critics get it so wrong? I, I would think that they, uh, they read it right, 
uh, and they realized what it was trying to do, and then they realized they didn't like that, so they denied their own response. And that, I think, is the worst thing a critic can do. Uh, when you, uh, you know it in your heart, but then you think, I'm going to suppress this because it is giving an answer which I, I didn't expect and I, 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 I don't like. So uh, I think there was a kind of a self-censorship there. Um, I think that uh, one thing is that uh, there's a kind of ideological opposition. Uh, the Tolkien, in a way, was sticking up for the past, and not just the far remote past, but also actually the near past. Perhaps we're going back to the First World War again. After the First World War, the dominant literary response to everything was irony. Now, Tolkien was capable of irony, uh, but he did not actually write in an ironic mode. Actually, I think uh, he was writing in a romantic mode. And that mode, they thought, had, uh, th that mode, should we say, the critics thought, the academic world thought, had actually been completely uh, drained. It had finished. You couldn't do it again. And here's somebody coming along, insisting on doing something again, which they thought they'd buried. But he resurrected it. Well, uh, that couldn't be allowed. And so the feeling was, uh, we're, we're, this is a success, but we're not going to admit that. We're going to say it's a failure because on our little plan of, literary genres, it ought to be a failure. You can't do things like that anymore. People are various, and tastes differ, uh, and not everybody's going to like the same thing. I don't recommend The Lord of the Rings to people, um, because I'd rather have them discover it, and because I'm not sure, uh, until I know somebody very well, whether they're going to like it or not. Uh, you know, Tolkien wrote an essay uh, on Beowulf, in which he took on all the people who were embarrassed at the fact that Beowulf was about a man who fought dragons and dismissed it as a fairy story um, because they were slightly uneasy with the idea that a grown-up person would write or sing or be involved in such a story. And I think there's still a lot of people who would have that response. Um, and for those people, uh, that's not their book, and for people who like that sort of thing, that's the sort of thing they like. Among the people who definitely did not like Tolkien's book were many of his fellow academics, and this attitude prevails today. The uh, academic reaction has been, I think, comically bad. Uh, I can understand people saying, I don't like this book, and I don't think anybody should write it, like this book. That, that makes sense. But uh, ever from, from the, the moment The Lord of the Rings was published, uh, you've got people saying, I don't like this book, and nobody else does either. And that's just not true. You can say, I don't like it, and anybody who doesn't like it is an idiot. That's, that's understandable. But then you've got to explain why there are so many people like that. And actually, it would be a better idea to try to explain why it was successful. But actually, there's been very strong aversion, as I say, to doing that. There were people who were reading the book and then averting their eyes and talking about some other book they thought they might have read. But they disliked it so much they couldn't watch it. They couldn't see it clearly. Now that, I think, was quite an interesting reaction. If you create that reaction in people, you have, uh, you have so to speak, hit them on the funny bone. And you then wonder quite, you know, how he managed to do that. But I think there's another reason, which is this, that um, Tolkien, like me, uh, was the professor of English language. And... Uh, he spent his time teaching uh, Old English and Middle English and Old Icelandic and unfashionable subjects like that. Well, as long as that stayed in a kind of ghetto, uh, people were quite prepared to, uh, to accept it. It was a minority subject uh, taught to small numbers of students uh, which could uh, perhaps safely be patronised. And uh, what I think was particularly uh, uh, irritating was to find that uh, uh, the literary success of the century uh, coming out of Oxford University was not one of the runners they'd backed uh, but one of the runners they hadn't backed. In fact, one of the runners they were dead sure wasn't going to start. And the, the sudden appearance, as it were, of this minority subject appealing to a very large community over the heads of the accredited scholars and the accredited literary critics and the academic world in general, that actually must have been, uh, well, a shock and uh, an embarrassment. And I think those reactions are still very prominent. The Lord of the Rings' popularity and appeal may have offended the academic establishment, but the book became a huge success, with a particular following in the United States, where part of its appeal was its very Englishness. I think he is profoundly English, and uh, very deeply rooted in a particular time in his countries and in uh, Western European history, a sort of between the wars period.
which I think his work very much reflects, although it is not an allegory of it. But any great work is going to exceed its national boundaries um, without um, betraying its own uh, cultural heritage. And I think The Lord of the Rings does become international um, partly by virtue of the fact that it is so very English. I was aware that the book had gotten uh, a sort of second wind because I would see people reading it in grocery store lines and bus queues and things like that. Um, I wasn't so aware of what has since become described as the Tolkien phenomenon or the Tolkien cult. Um, and I'm not sure that it was that. It coincided with the time of great upheaval in our political and social and psychological life. And the book did speak very strongly to a lot of young people at that time, but it's kept on speaking since. Letters from readers poured in from all over the world. One of these came from the then Princess Margreda of Denmark. She had read and been greatly moved by The Lord of the Rings. Ever since I grew up, I have loved fairy stories, legends and sagas, and to find that anyone of today obviously shares the same love and moreover takes it seriously enough to write a complete new cycle of legends, as natural as the traditional ones, has been a wonderful experience. But I do not think I have ever believed in fairies or elves so much before I got to know the Lord of the Rings. I don't think your tale would have been possible if the elves hadn't had a hand in it. There seems to be something more to it than can be explained by scholarly imagination and inspired writing. With her letter, the princess enclosed some semi-abstract illustrations which Tolkien liked. In particular, her drawing of the devastated Shire showed a scene which he described as dismally and meanly hideous. Dreadfully like what happened to the village in which I lived as a child almost as soon as I had left it. Well, of course, I mean, you can't, uh, one can't help remembering the, the, the hymn line of the dark satanic mills. Of course. I've been to school in England for a year, so I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, otherwise, I suppose I just uh, his description of the of of these houses with with ugly narrow windows uh, corresponded so very much to among other things the the, um, the sort of ugly buildings that, that the, the Germans put up during the war in, in, in certain places where they did uh, where they um, fortified the coasts on the west coast, looking onto the North Sea, and and, and they you can spot those buildings even today immediately because they. The, the window, the proportions of the windows are so ugly. Strangely narrow and high-shouldered, unpleasant. And, and it was so strange that he should describe exactly the same kind of ugliness that to me is the essence of ugliness, of bad architecture, so to speak. So I suppose that's what I, what I tried to put in. Queen Margreda has continued to be inspired by Tolkien's writing. This is a watercolour that I did sometime, I think, in the late 70s, probably. Anyway, after I'd read The Silmarillion. It's really after the story of, 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 of Turin to Ramba, it's when his old father is released and comes back and finds, I think it's his wife, yes, his wife, sitting at the stone which was put up where, where, where Turin and, and, and his sister were buried. J.R.R. Tolkien's books have sold millions of copies and have been translated into over 25 languages. The Lord of the Rings, in particular, has clearly touched people from all walks of life and different cultures. But Tolkien was concerned that the work was often misinterpreted as allegorical or condemned as escapist. Many people apply to a uh, nuclear, the, the ring, to, particularly the nuclear bomb, don't they? I think that, that was in my mind, is that the whole thing is only an allegory of it. But it isn't. People can, of course, find allegories if they wish to, but it, as you can see, it was wholly outside his conception of what he was doing in what he called fantasy. The world he created exists for itself and for what it tells you and for what delight it gives you. It may, of course, contain, uh, as indeed it does, elements of his own um, comprehension, his view of the world at large, 
but not anything out of the primary world. Just as it contains no specific reference to the Christian religion, it actually contains no specific reference to communism or fascism, absolutely not. His view of such things, if, uh, if available at all, will be in solution in the secondary mythical or mythological world that he has created, but not actually itself. Therefore, it is in no sense an allegory. The double meaning is not present. Escape uh, is a different question. He was there, perhaps more deeply uh, hostile, because escape is used has often been used as a, as a means of attack on the very conception of fantasy, of the secondary world. And he, in a sense, he, he said, uh, of course it is an escape, if you like, because it's a movement out of the primary world, which isn't such a pleasant place, into a secondary world that may not be very much more pleasant, but it's any rate very different. And there are terrors as well as beauties in the secondary world. But it is not. Um, he said that his critics had cho chosen the wrong word. They, he said they were perhaps maliciously confounding the escape of the prisoner with the flight of the deserter. And why should what he offered, if it is escape, not be the escape of the prisoner, which in other contexts is regarded as a very noble thing to try to do, to get away. But they are twisting it and suggesting that he shouldn't get away. He should stay very firmly in the primary world. With all the attention he was receiving, instead of a quiet retirement, Tolkien found to his amazement that his books had brought him enormous success and fame. He was uh, overwhelmed, in a sense, by fame um, because it distracted him. And he was too easily distracted, perhaps. Uh, he uh, did have a few luxuries which fame gave him when um, the money began to flow. He took taxis, for instance. But outwardly, he was the same man, living in the same modest way, uh, absolutely unspoiled. And this was very, very attractive to those who came, as I did, to see him. He was not the grand man. Um, too um, famous to um, give you more than a quarter of an hour. Uh, he was the same Professor Tolkien, interested in um, uh, whatever happened to be at the moment on the top of the agenda, making these jokes, striking matches, lighting his pipe, and um, roaring with laughter. He was a good friend. He was very much what one imagines an Oxford Don to look like. When I knew him, he was uh, grey-haired, uh, swift of speech, but a little bit uh, incomprehensible at times. He spoke, uh, he tripped almost over his own uh, words. He would laugh immoderately at his own jokes, uh, often when you hadn't heard them properly. Uh, he was the soul of courtesy. He was a Victorian, um, by nature of birth, really, and he had many Victorian qualities. Uh, which I think we miss today, um, that innate courtesy in dealing with people, uh, and uh, especially with people out of generation as I was, uh, he never made me, uh, he tried never to make me feel uh, embarrassed by his company. Um, I was often embarrassed by his company because he was a ferocious intellect. Uh, he didn't throw this at me in any sense but one was aware of it all the time. And um, he was um, a man who was loyal, almost in, in an unbelievable sense, once he got to trust you. In 1968, the Tolkiens moved from Oxford to Bournemouth, a place much loved by Edith, and where they lived for three years before she died. Tolkien returned to Oxford, when Merton College offered him rooms in a neighbouring street, close both to the college and its gardens, whose beauty and serenity he had always enjoyed. But on his mind 
was The Silmarillion, the book all Tolkien readers were waiting for, but which he was finding impossible to finish. I think one must say it was the last version of The Silmarillion that he couldn't finish. He couldn't finish A Silmarillion uh, that would stand in relation to The Lord of the Rings. It was inevitable that the Lord of the Rings must alter the Silmarillion because having once been, as I've said, an enclosed myth with a beginning and an end, it now has the vast extension. And in the Lord of the Rings, there are major figures who come out of the elder days, out of the, pri the primeval world of the Silmarillion, chief among them, uh, Galadriel. So a great deal of writing back would have to be done. But my father being who he was, this writing back would never be a simple thing because he, when Galadriel enters out of the Lord of the Rings into the world of the elves in Valinor, new stories begin. Right up to the end of his life, Galadriel's position in the elder days was still being developed. So this was a, a, a major problem, but I think there were deeper problems than this. I think that in his later years, he became, he had become detached in a way from the old legends, Turin, Berin, and so on. And they were immensely important to him, but they were things that, uh, they were like the legends of the real world. Which he, could, which he could observe and study. And he became more and more interested, I think, more and more, more and more interested in the, what you might call the metaphysical aspects of, the, uh, of his secondary invention. Above all, with the nature of the elves. Because it is absolutely fundamental to the whole conception is that men are mortal and elves are immortal. And as he declared, I'm sure rightly declared, the, the fundamental underpinning concern of all his work was death, the intolerable fact. And the nature of the elves, going right back to the Book of Lost Tales, was above all that they were immortal. They were not naturally destined to die. They could be killed because they had bodies. But they were not in their nature destined to die, whereas men are of their nature destined to spend only a short while in the world, whereas the life of the elves was coterminous with the life of Arda. Arda being the elvish word for the world, our world, of which Middle Earth was a part. And so in his later years, he became involved in profound attempts to determine the nature of an immortal being who is nonetheless incarnate and possesses a body. This would in turn was beginning to develop new stories within the Silmarillion. And I think the whole thing simply became too large, too complex uh, to have so precise, to attempt to impose so precise a metaphysical explanation on it. It was perhaps a task for a younger man. The flame began to die down and he hadn't the energy left that would be needed for such a huge transformation. Some people who knew him well thought that he didn't really, have said that he didn't really want to finish the Silmarillion, suggesting even that in, at some level he felt that to finish the Silmarillion would be finishing his life. I personally don't think that at all. I don't think there's any real evidence for it. I think he deeply wanted to finish it, but could too large, too large a, a, a task 
too tired. In the last photograph taken of him, he is standing by one of his favourite trees, the great black pine in Oxford's Botanic Gardens. Less than a month later, on September the 2nd, 1973, J.R.R. Tolkien died, aged 81, and was buried with Edith in Wolvercote Cemetery. Christopher Tolkien brought the Silmarillion into publishable form after his father's death, and like the previous books, it became a bestseller. Interest in Tolkien's writing is as flourishing today as ever, with each new generation discovering the delights of his created world. There is a great hunger for um, some kind of literary tradition, I feel, among my students so that I get students who have read Tolkien's Lord of the Rings ten times and students who've never read it but are pulled into it by the idea that there's a connection between the medieval and the modern that they want to explore. The book taps into, I think, some very old patterns of desire that everybody has of wanting a world that's richer and deeper and more alive than the one that Descartes has given us. Uh, wanting to find not magic but enchantment in the world around us, which Tolkien's world will give you on an abiding basis so that when you have closed the book, you can look around you and, and your eyes still keep that imprint. You still see that world in the world that you live in.